James Abram Garfield was the 20th President of the United States, serving from March 4, 1881, until his assassination later that year. Garfield had served nine terms in the House of Representatives, and had been elected to the Senate before his candidacy for the White House. Though he declined the Senate seat once he was elected president, he is the only sitting House member to be elected president. Garfield was raised in humble circumstances on an Ohio farm by his widowed mother. He worked at various jobs, including on a canal boat. In his youth, beginning at age 17, he attended several Ohio schools, then studied at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, from which he graduated in 1856. A year later, Garfield entered politics as a Republican. He married Lucretia Rudolph in 1858, and served as a member of the Ohio State Senate. Garfield opposed Confederate secession, served as a major general in the Union Army during the American Civil War, and fought in the battles of Middle Creek, Shiloh, and Chickamauga. He was first elected to Congress in 1862 to represent Ohio's 19th District. Throughout Garfield's extended congressional service after the Civil War, he firmly supported the gold standard and gained a reputation as a skilled orator. Garfield initially agreed with radical Republican views regarding Reconstruction, but later favored a moderate approach for civil rights enforcement for freedmen. At the 1880 Republican National Convention, Senator-elect Garfield attended as campaign manager for Secretary of the Treasury John Sherman, and gave the presidential nomination speech for him, when neither Sherman nor his rivals, question mark, Ulysses S. Grant and James G. Blaine, could get enough votes to secure the nomination. Delegates chose Garfield as a compromise on the 36th ballot. In the 1880 presidential election, Garfield conducted a low-key front porch campaign, and narrowly defeated Democrat Winfield Scott Hancock. Garfield's accomplishments as president included a resurgence of presidential authority against senatorial courtesy in executive appointments, energizing American naval power, and purging corruption in the post office. All during his extremely short time in office, Garfield made notable diplomatic and judiciary appointments, including a U.S. Supreme Court Justice. He enhanced the powers of the presidency when he defied the powerful New York Senator Roscoe, conquering by appointing William H. Roberts into the lucrative post of collector of the Port of New York, starting a fracas that ended with Robertson's confirmation and Conkling's resignation from the Senate. Garfield advocated agricultural technology, an educated electorate, and civil rights for African Americans. He also proposed substantial civil service reform, eventually passed by Congress in 1883 and signed into law by his successor, Chester A. Arthur, as the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. With his term cut short by his death after only 200 days, and much of it spent in ill health trying to recover from the attack, Garfield is little remembered other than for his assassination. Historians often forego listing him in rankings of U.S. presidents due to the short length of his presidency. Childhood James Garfield was born the youngest of five children on November 19, 1831, in a log cabin in Orange Township, now Moreland Hills, Ohio. Orange Township was located in the Western Reserve, and like many who settled there, Garfield's ancestors were from New England. James's father Abram had been born in Worcester, New York, and came to Ohio to woo his childhood sweetheart, Mahitable Ballou, only to find her married. He instead wed her sister Elisa, who had been born in New Hampshire. James was named for an older brother, dead in infancy. In early 1833, Abram and Eliza Garfield joined the Church of Christ, a decision that would help shape their youngest son's life. Poor and fatherless, Garfield was mocked by his fellow boys, and throughout his life was very sensitive to slights. 
He escaped through reading, devouring all the books he could find. After six weeks, illness forced Garfield to return home and, during his recuperation, his mother and a local education official got him to promise to postpone his return to the canals for a year and go to school. Accordingly, in 1848, he began at Geauga Seminary in nearby Chester Township. Education, Marriage and Early Career At Geauga Academy, which he attended from 1848 to 1850, Garfield learned academic subjects he had not previously had time for. He shone as a student, and was especially interested in languages and elocution. He began to appreciate the power a speaker had over an audience, writing that the speaker's platform creates some excitement. I love agitation and investigation and glory in defending unpopular truth against popular error. Quote. After leaving Giaga, Garfield worked for a year at various jobs, including teaching. Garfield graduated from Williams in August 1856 as salutatorian, giving an address at the commencement. Garfield biographer Ira Ritkow pointed out that the future president's years at Williams gave Garfield the opportunity to know and respect those of different social backgrounds. And despite his origin as an unsophisticated Westerner, he was liked and respected by socially conscious New Englanders. In short, as Ritkow later wrote, Garfield had an extensive and positive first experience with the world outside the Western Reserve of Ohio. Quote, On his return to Ohio, the degree from a prestigious Eastern school made Garfield a man of distinction. He returned to Hiram to teach at the Institute, and in 1857 was made its president. He did not see education as a field in which he could realize his full potential. At Williams, he had become more politically aware in the intensely anti-slavery atmosphere of the Massachusetts school, and began to consider politics as a career. Local Republican Party leaders invited Garfield to enter politics upon the death of Cyrus Prentice, the presumptive nominee for the local state Senate seat. He was nominated by the party convention on the sixth ballot, and was elected, serving until 1861. Civil War After Abraham Lincoln's election as president, several southern states announced their secession from the Union to form a new government, the Confederate States of America. Garfield read military texts while anxiously awaiting the war effort which he regarded as a holy crusade against the slave power. At Governor William Dennison's request, Garfield deferred his military ambitions to remain in the legislature, where he helped appropriate the funds to raise and equip Ohio's volunteer regiments. Buell's Command Buell quickly assigned Garfield the task of driving Confederate forces out of eastern Kentucky giving him the 18th Brigade for the campaign which, besides his own 42nd, included the 40th Ohio Infantry, two Kentucky Infantry Regiments and two Cavalry Units. In recognition of his success, Garfield was promoted to Brigadier General at the age of 30. Garfield's promotion gave him command of the 20th Brigade of the Army of the Ohio which was ordered in early 1862 to join Major General Ulysses S. Grant's forces as they advanced on Corinth, Mississippi. That summer Garfield suffered from jaundice and significant weight loss. Chief of Staff for Rosecrans The position of Chief of Staff for a general was usually held by a more junior officer, but Garfield's influence with Rosecrans was greater than usual with duties extending beyond mere communication of orders to duties that involved actual management of his Army of the Cumberland. At the ensuing Battle of Chickamauga on September 19 and 20, 1863, confusion among the wing commanders over Rosecrans's orders created a gap in the lines, resulting in a rout of the right flank. Rosecrans concluded that the battle was lost and fell back on Chattanooga to establish a defensive line. Congressional career 
election in 1862, Civil War years. While serving in the Army in early 1862, Garfield was approached by friends about running for Congress from Ohio's newly redrawn, heavily Republican 19th District. He was worried that he and other state-appointed generals would get obscure assignments, and running for Congress would allow him to resume his political career. The fact that the new Congress would not hold its first regular session until December 1863, Soon after the nomination, Garfield was ordered to report to War Secretary Edwin Stanton in Washington to discuss his military future. There, Garfield met Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase, who befriended him, seeing him as a younger version of himself. The two men agreed politically, and both were part of the radical wing of the Republican Party. Garfield not only favored abolition of slavery, but believed that the leaders of the rebellion had forfeited their constitutional rights. He supported the confiscation of southern plantations and even exile or execution of rebellion leaders as a means to ensure the permanent destruction of slavery. Under Chase's influence, Garfield became a staunch proponent of a dollar backed by a gold standard, and was therefore a strong opponent of the greenback. He regretted very much but understood the necessity for suspension of payment in gold or silver during the emergency presented by the Civil War. Garfield did not consider Lincoln particularly worthy of re-election, but no viable alternative seemed available. He will probably be the man, though I think we could do better. Quote, Garfield took up the practice of law in 1865 as a means to improve his personal finances. His efforts took him to Wall Street where, the day after Lincoln's assassination, a riotous crowd led him into an impromptu speech to Comet. Fellow citizens, clouds and darkness are round about him. His pavilion is dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Justice and judgment are the establishment of his throne. Mercy and truth shall go before his face. Fellow citizens, God reigns and the government at Washington still lives. Quote. Reconstruction After the war, Garfield became a proponent of black suffrage, though he admitted that the idea of African Americans as political equals with whites gave him a strong feeling of repugnance. The conflict between the branches of government was the major issue of the 1866 campaign, with Johnson taking to the campaign trail in a swing around the circle and Garfield facing opposition within his party in his home district, with the South still disenfranchised and Northern public opinion behind them. The Republicans gained a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. Garfield, having overcome his challengers at his district nominating convention, was easily re-elected. Garfield opposed the initial talk of impeaching President Johnson when Congress convened in December 1866. By the time Ulysses S. Grant succeeded Johnson in 1869, Garfield had moved away from the remaining radicals. Stevens, their leader, had died in 1868. He hailed the ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870 as a triumph and he favored the readmission of Georgia to the Union as a matter of right, not politics. In 1871, Garfield opposed passage of the Ku Klux Klan Act, saying, I have never been more perplexed by a piece of legislation. He was torn between his indignation at these terrorists and his concern for the freedoms endangered by the power the bill gave to the president to enforce the act through suspension of habeas corpus tariffs and finance. Throughout his political career, Garfield favored the gold standard and decried attempts to increase the money supply through the issuance of paper money not backed by gold, and later, through the free and unlimited coinage of silver. Tariffs had been raised to high levels during the Civil War. Afterwards, Garfield, who made a close study of financial affairs, advocated moving towards free trade, though the standard Republican position was a protective tariff that would allow American 
industries to grow. This break with his party likely cost him his place on the Ways and Means Committee in 1867, and though Republicans held the majority in the House until 1875, Garfield remained off that committee during that time. Garfield came to chair the powerful House Appropriations Committee, but it was Ways and Means, with its influence over fiscal policy, that he really wanted to lead. In September 1870, Garfield, who was then chairman of the House Banking Committee, led an investigation into the Black Friday gold panic scandal. The committee investigation into corruption was thorough, but found no indictable offenses. Garfield blamed the easy availability of fiat money greenbacks for financing the speculation that led to the scandal. Garfield was not at all enthused about the re-election of President Grant in 1872, until Horace Greeley, who emerged as the candidate of the Democrats and Liberal Republicans, became the only serious alternative. Garfield opined, I would say Grant was not fit to be nominated and Greeley is not fit to be elected. Quote. Credit Mobilier Scandal, Salary Grab The Credit Mobilier of America scandal involved corruption in the financing of the Union Pacific Railroad, part of the Transcontinental Railroad that was completed in 1869. Union Pacific officers and directors secretly purchased control of the Credit Mobilier of America Company, then contracted with the firm to have it undertake the construction of the railroad. The grossly inflated invoices submitted by the company were paid by the railroad, using federal funds appropriated to subsidize the project, and the company was allowed to purchase Union Pacific securities at par value, well below the market rate. Credit Mobilier showed large profits and stock gains, and distributed substantial dividends. The high expenses meant that Congress was called upon to appropriate more funds. One of the railroad officials who controlled Credit Mobilier was also a congressman, Oaks Ames of Massachusetts. He offered some of his colleagues the opportunity to buy Credit Mobilier stock at par value, well below what it sold for on the market and the railroad got its additional appropriations. Editorial Cartoon Uncle Sam directs you. S. Senators and representatives implicated in the Credit Mobilier scheme to commit harakiri. The story broke in July 1872, in the middle of the presidential campaign. Among those named were Vice President and former House Speaker, Schuyler Colfax, Grant's second term running mate. Massachusetts Senator Henry Wilson, Speaker James G. Blaine of Maine, and Garfield. Greeley had little luck taking advantage of the scandal. When Congress reconvened after the election, Blaine, seeking to clear his name, demanded a House investigation. Evidence before the special committee exonerated Blaine. Garfield had stated, in September 1872, that Ames had offered him stock but he had repeatedly refused it. Testifying before the committee in January, Ames alleged that he had offered Garfield 10 shares of stock at par value, but that Garfield had never taken the shares, or paid for them. A year had passed, from 1867 to 1868, before Garfield had finally refused it. Garfield, appearing before the committee on January 14, 1873, confirmed much of this. Ames testified several weeks later that Garfield agreed to take the stock on credit, and that it was paid for by the company's huge dividends. Garfield's biographers were unwilling to exonerate him in Credit Mobilier, with Alan Peskin writing, Did Garfield lie? Not exactly. Did he tell the truth? Not completely. Was he corrupted? Not really. Even Garfield's enemies never claimed that his involvement influenced his behavior. Another issue that caused Garfield trouble in his 1874 re-election bid was the so-called salary grab of 1873, which increased the compensation for members of Congress by 50 percent. Retroactive to 1871, Garfield was responsible, as Appropriations Committee Chairman, 
for shepherding the legislative appropriations bill through the House. During the debate in February 1873, Massachusetts Representative Benjamin Butler offered the increase as an amendment, and despite Garfield's opposition, it passed the House and eventually became law. The law was very popular in the House, as almost half the members were lame ducks, but the public was outraged, and many of Garfield's constituents blamed him, though he refused to accept the increase in what was a bad year for Republicans who lost control of the House for the first time since the Civil War. Garfield had his closest congressional election, winning with only 57% of the vote. Minority Leader, Hayes Administration With the Democratic takeover of the House of Representatives in 1875, Garfield lost his chairmanship of the Appropriations Committee. The Democratic leadership in the House appointed Garfield as a Republican member of Ways and Means, with many of his leadership rivals defeated in the 1874 Democratic landslide, and Blaine elected to the Senate. Garfield was seen as the Republican floor leader and the likely speaker should the party regain control of the chamber. As the 1876 presidential election approached, Garfield was loyal to the candidacy of Senator Blaine, and fought for the former Speaker's nomination at the 1876 Republican National Convention in Cincinnati, when it became clear, after six ballots, that Blaine could not prevail. The convention nominated Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes. Although Garfield had supported Blaine, he had kept good relations with Hayes, and wholeheartedly supported the governor. Garfield, second from right in the row of commissioners just below the gallery, served on the electoral commission that decided the disputed 1876 presidential election, painting by Cornelia Dell's strong facet. When Hayes appeared to have lost the presidential election the following month to Democrat Samuel Tilden, the Republicans launched efforts to reverse the result in southern states where they held the governorship. South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. If Hayes won all three states, he would take the election by a single electoral vote. Grant asked Garfield to serve as a neutral observer in the recount in Louisiana. The observers soon recommended to the state electoral commissions that Hayes be declared the winner. Garfield recommended that the entire vote of West Feliciana Parish, which had given Tilden a sizable majority, be thrown out. The Republican governors of the three states certified that Hayes had won their states. To the outrage of Democrats, who had the state legislature submit rival returns, and threatened to prevent the counting of the electoral vote. Under the Constitution, Congress is the final arbiter of the election. Congress then passed a bill establishing the Electoral Commission to determine the winner. Although he opposed the commission, feeling that Congress should count the vote and proclaim Hayes victorious. Garfield was appointed to it over the objections of Democrats that he was too partisan. Hayes emerged the victor by a commission vote of 8-7, to seven, with all eight votes being cast by Republican politicians or appointees of that party to the Supreme Court, as part of the deal whereby they recognized Hayes as president. Southern Democrats secured the removal of federal troops from the South, ending Reconstruction. Although a Senate seat would be disposed of by the Ohio General Assembly after the resignation of John Sherman to become Treasury Secretary, Hayes needed Garfield's expertise to protect him from the agenda of a hostile Congress, and asked him not to seek it. Garfield, as the President's key legislator, gained considerable prestige and respect for his role. Garfield during this time purchased the property and mentor that reporters later dubbed Lawnfield. Legal career and other activities Garfield was one of three attorneys who argued for the petitioners in the landmark Supreme Court. Case ex party Milligan in 1866. The petitioners were pro-Confederate Northern men who had been found guilty and sentenced to death by a military court for treasonous activities. 
The case turned on whether the defendants should instead have been tried by a civilian court, and resulted in a ruling that civilians could not be tried before military tribunals while the civil courts were operating. The oral argument was Garfield's first court appearance. Jeremiah Black had taken him in as a junior partner a year before, and assigned the case to him in light of his highly regarded oratory skills. With the result, Garfield instantly achieved a reputation as a preeminent appellate lawyer. During Grant's first term, discontented with public service, Garfield pursued opportunities in the law, but declined a partnership offer when told his prospective partner was of intemperate and licentious reputation. Garfield thought the land grants given to expanding railroads to be an unjust practice. As well, he opposed some monopolistic practices by corporations, as well as the power sought by the workers' unions. In 1876, Garfield displayed his mathematical talent when he developed a trapezoid proof of the Pythagorean theorem. His finding was placed in the New England Journal of Education. Mathematics historian William Dunham stated that Garfield's trapezoid work was really a very clever proof. Presidential election of 1880 Campaign against Hancock Despite including a stalwart on the ticket, animosity between the Republican factions carried over from the convention, and Garfield traveled to New York to meet with party leaders there. The rear of the house at Garfield's Lawnfield estate, from which he conducted his front porch campaign. Practical differences between the candidates were few, and Republicans began the campaign with the familiar theme of waving the bloody shirt reminding Northern voters that the Democratic Party was responsible for secession and four years of civil war, and that if Democrats held power they would reverse the gains of that war, dishonor Union veterans, and pay Confederate veterans pensions out of the federal treasury. Presidency, 1881 Cabinet and Inauguration Between his election and his inauguration, Garfield was occupied with assembling a cabinet that would establish peace between Conklings and Blaine's warring factions. Blaine's delegates had provided much of the support for Garfield's nomination, and the main senator received the place of honor. Secretary of State Distracted by cabinet maneuvering, Garfield's inaugural address was not up to his typical oratorical standards. Garfield's appointment of James infuriated Conkling, a factional opponent of the Postmaster General, who demanded a compensatory appointment for his faction, such as the position of Secretary of the Treasury. The resulting squabble occupied much of Garfield's brief presidency. The feud with Conkling reached a climax when the president, at Blaine's instigation, nominated Conkling's enemy, Judge William H. Robertson to be collector of the Port of New York. This was one of the prize patronage positions below cabinet level, and was then held by Edwin A. Merritt. Conkling raised the time-honored principle of senatorial courtesy in an attempt to defeat the nomination. To no avail, Garfield, who believed the practice to be corrupt, would not back down and threaten to withdraw all nominations unless Robertson was confirmed intending to settle the question whether the president is registering clerk of the Senate or the executive of the United States. Quote. Reforms In 1881 Buck cartoon shows Garfield finding a baby at his front door with a tag marked, Civil Service Reform, compliments of R. B. Hayes. Hayes, his predecessor in the presidency, is seen in the background dressed like a woman and holding a bag marked R. B. Hayes Savings, Fremont, Ohio. Grant and Hayes had both advocated civil service reform, and by 1881, civil service reform associations had organized with renewed energy across the nation. Garfield sympathized with them, believing that the spoil system damaged the presidency and distracted from more important concerns. Corruption in the post office also cried out for reform. 
In April 1880, there had been a congressional investigation into corruption in the post office department, in which profiteering rings allegedly stole millions of dollars, securing bogus mail contracts on star routes, civil rights and education. Garfield believed that, the key to improving the state of African American civil rights would be found in education aided by the federal government, foreign policy and naval reform. Entering the presidency, Garfield had little foreign policy experience, so he leaned heavily on Blaine. Blaine, a former protectionist, now agreed with Garfield on the need to promote freer trade, especially within the Western Hemisphere. Administration and Cabinet Assassination Garfield, shot by Charles J. Guido, collapses as Secretary of State Blaine gestures for help. Engraving from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, Guito and shooting. Garfield was shot by Charles J. Guido, a disgruntled office seeker, at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in Washington, D.C. on July 2, 1881. After 11 weeks of intensive and other care Garfield died in Elberon, New Jersey, the second of four presidents to be assassinated. Following Abraham Lincoln, Guito had followed various professions in his life but in 1880 had determined to gain federal office by supporting what he expected to be the winning Republican ticket. One of President Garfield's more wearying duties was seeing office seekers, and he saw Guito at least once. White House officials suggested to Guito that he approach Blaine, as the consulship was within the Department of State. Guito came to believe he had lost the position because he was a stalwart, the office seeker decided that, the only way to end the internecine warfare in the Republican Party, was for Garfield to die. Though he had nothing personal against the president, Arthur's succession would restore peace, he felt, and lead to rewards for fellow stalwarts, including Guido. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln was deemed a fluke due to the Civil War, and Garfield, like most people, saw no reason why the president should be guarded. Garfield's movements and plans were often printed in the newspapers. Guito knew the president would leave Washington for cooler climes on July 2, and made plans to kill him before then. He purchased a gun he thought would look good in a museum, and followed Garfield several times. But each time his plans were frustrated, or he lost his nerve. Guito concealed himself by the latest waiting room at the 6th Street station of the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad, from where Garfield was scheduled to depart. Most of Garfield's cabinet planned to accompany him at least part of the way. Blaine, who was to remain in Washington, came to the station to see him off. The two men were deep in conversation and did not notice Guito before he took out his revolver and shot Garfield twice once in the back and once in the arm. The time was 9.30 a.m. The assassin attempted to leave the station, but was quickly captured. Treatment and death Garfield was hit by two shots. One glanced off his arm while the other pierced his back, shattering a rib and embedding itself in his abdomen. My God, what is this? He exclaimed. Among those at the station was Robert Todd Lincoln who 16 years before had watched his father die from an assassin's bullet. Garfield was taken on a mattress upstairs to a private office, where several doctors examined him, probing the wound with unwashed fingers. At his request, Garfield was taken back to the White House, and his wife, then in New Jersey, was sent for. Although Joseph Lister's pioneering work in antisepsis was known to American doctors, with Lister himself having visited America in 1876. Few of them had confidence in it, and none of his advocates were among Garfield's treating physicians. Over the next few days, Garfield made some improvement, as the nation viewed the news from the Capitol and prayed. Although he never stood again, 
he was able to sit up and write several times. And his recovery was viewed so positively that a steamer was fitted out as a seagoing hospital to aid with his convalescence. He was nourished on oatmeal, which he detested, and milk from a cow on the White House lawn. When told that Indian chief sitting bull, a prisoner of the army, was starving, Garfield said, let him starve, then, oh, no, send him my oatmeal, quote. Beginning on July 23rd, Garfield took a turn for the worse. His temperature increased to 104. F. Doctors, concerned by an abscess that had developed by the wound, operated and inserted a drainage tube. This initially seemed to help, and Garfield, in his bed, was able to hold a brief cabinet meeting on July 29th. Though members were under orders from Bliss to discuss nothing that might excite Garfield. Garfield had long been anxious to escape hot, unhealthy Washington. And in early September the doctors agreed to move him to Elberon, where his wife had recovered earlier in the summer. He left the White House for the last time on September 5th, traveling in a specially cushioned railway car, a spur line to the Franklin Cottage. A seaside mansion given over to his use, was built in a night by volunteers. There, Garfield could see the ocean as officials and reporters maintained what became. After an initial rally, a death watch, Garfield's personal secretary, Joe Stanley Brown, wrote 40 years later, To this day I cannot hear the sound of the low slow roll of the Atlantic on the shore, the sound which filled my ears as I walked from my cottage to his bedside, without recalling again that ghastly tragedy. Quote. On September 18, Garfield asked A. F. Rockwell, a friend, if he would have a place in history. Rockwell assured him he would, and told Garfield he had much work still before him. But his response was, No, my work is done. Quote. According to some historians and medical experts, Garfield might have survived his wounds had the doctors attending him had at their disposal. Today's medical research, techniques, and equipment. Guito was indicted on October 14, 1881, for the murder of the president. In a chaotic trial in which Guito often interrupted and argued, and in which his counsel used the insanity defense, the jury found him guilty on January 5, 1882, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. Guito may have had syphilis, a disease that causes physiological mental impairment. Funeral, Memorials and Commemorations Garfield's funeral train left Long Branch on the same special track that brought him there traveling over tracks blanketed with flowers and past houses adorned with flags. His body was transported to the Capitol and then continued on to Cleveland for burial. Memorials to Garfield were erected across the country. On April 10, 1882, seven months after Garfield's death, the U.S. Post Office issued a postage stamp in his honor. The second stamp issued by the U.S to honor an assassinated president. On May 19, 1890, Garfield's body was permanently interred, with a great solemnity and fanfare, in a mausoleum in Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland. Attending the dedication ceremonies were former President Hayes, President Benjamin Harrison, and future President William McKinley. Garfield's murder by a deranged office seeker awakened public awareness of the need for civil service reform legislation. Senator George H. Pendleton, a Democrat from Ohio, launched a reform effort that resulted in the Pendleton Act in January 1883. Legacy and Historical View For a few years after his assassination, Garfield's life story was seen as an exemplar of the American success story, that even the poorest boy might someday become President of the United States. Peskin noted that, in mourning Garfield, Americans were not only honoring a president, they were paying tribute to a man whose life story embodied their own most cherished aspirations. The 20th century saw no revival for Garfield. 
Thomas Wolfe deemed the presidents of the Gilded Age, including Garfield, lost Americans, whose gravely vacant and beviscered faces mixed, melted, swam together. Garfield's biographers, and those who have studied his presidency, tend to think well of him, and that his presidency saw a promising start before its untimely end. Historian Justice D. Donick, while deeming Garfield a bit of an enigma, chronicles his achievements by winning a victory over the stalwarts. He enhanced both the power and prestige of his office. As a man, he was intelligent, sensitive, and alert, and his knowledge of how government worked was unmatched. Quote, True, his accomplishments were neither bold nor heroic. But his was not an age that called for heroism. His stormy presidency was brief, and in some respects, unfortunate. But he did leave the office stronger than he found it. As a public man he had a hand in almost every issue of national importance for almost two decades. While as a party leader he, along with Blaine, forged the Republican Party into the instrument that would lead the United States into the 20th century.